getting women without a doubt into elected office and in other public leadership positions is something that is increasingly central to our mission as we think about what a Wellesley education means. And we know that getting more women into these critical positions is good for the country and we know it's good for the world. Welcome to Straight Talk, a podcast about big ideas featuring candid discussions with some of the world's foremost thinkers and doers. I'm Hank Paulson, chairman of the Paulson Institute, and today I'm speaking with Paula Johnson. Paula is president of Wellesley College, widely acknowledged as the nation's top women's college. She is the college's first African-American president. Before coming to Wellesley in 2016, Paula founded and served as the inaugural executive director of the Connors Center for Women's Health and Gender Biology and was chief of the Division of Women's Health, both at Brigham and Women's Hospital, a Harvard teaching hospital, and one of the world's leading academic medical centers. Paula was also the Gracie A. Young Family Professor of Medicine and Women's Health at Harvard Medical School and a professor of epidemiology at the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health. Paula, welcome to the podcast. As you know, I have a special affinity for Wellesley College. My wife, sister, mother, and grandmother all graduated from Wellesley. And so I've been to more Wellesley events and reunions than those of my own alma mater. It's a special school with a tradition of excellence and you are bringing it to new heights and adapting it for today's world. So let's start at the beginning. You grew up in Brooklyn. What was your family like? What inspired you to pursue a career in medicine? Talk a bit about how your interests and your career unfolded. Well, Hank, um, first of all, I just wanna say thank you for those kind words and also thank you for having me on the podcast. And I wanna say that, yes, there are a few men who have a better understanding and appreciation for Wellesley and even fewer who have done as much for the school as you and Wendy and your family has done, as well as for the Wellesley women in your life. So we are really grateful. But you know, as I reflect back over, over my life, I would say that there have been any number of people who have had great influence, but I would say you know, there are three women. One is my, my mother, who had not graduated from college, but had a tremendous sense of resilience and optimism uh, for the future and translated that, I think, really to both my sister and to me, and had a kind of perseverance and fierce love of education. And in fact, she ended up graduating from college the year after I graduated from medical school. So I'd say that it's, it's, you know, when I think about my mother, just fiercely uh, passionate about education and really passed on a real sense of resilience to my sister and me. But I would say, you know, as I think about my career, there are two women. One is my grandmother, who was really a, a, another phenomenal woman. And uh, we grew up together in a four family home in Brooklyn. And when she was about 60, she really became somewhat listless and withdrawn and stopped eating and a number of other complicating issues, but essentially had really been misdiagnosed for quite a while. And essentially she had depression. And I would say today we would know that immediately. I think at the time it wasn't hundred percent clear and even treatments were, were in their early days. And I really trace my interest in medicine and more specifically in women's health to this formative experience. And you know, I, I didn't really put that all together until a little bit later, but as I look back, it, it had such a tremendous impact. And then the second woman or the third woman really is the late Ruth Hubbard. And she was my college mentor. And I would say that if my grandmother had planted the seed, Ruth was the one who really allowed it to, to grow. And she was the first female biology professor to be tenured at Harvard. And she really became a very powerful feminist voice in and for science. And she actually 
you know, made explicit something that I think others might have known, but had not articulated. And that was a good uh, part of science really had made men the norm, both their bodies and their ideas. And much of what was deemed as scientific truth was really socially constructed and really needed re-examination. Now, whether you agree with that or not, I think that it was really her approach to the world, her approach to the real questioning. And she taught us how to interrogate accepted beliefs and that kind of focus on exploration and investigation and inclusion in science. I think was really critical. And uh, she was a remarkable role model and I took more than one course from her and had the honor of speaking at her memorial. But I carry her example with me and I'll be honest, my goal for all Wellesley students is to have that kind of inspiration uh, and support that I had at that early stage. What a great goal because I think just about everyone I know who has had a satisfactory or terrific career has had inspiration along the way and role models. So, and it's really inspiring to hear of your role models, but what were some of the obstacles you faced along the way? Because there had to have been plenty of obstacles. There, there are obstacles and there are probably too many to actually name. But what I would say is that as I really look back at this point in my life, so many of those challenges and obstacles in retrospect have proven really crucial to some of my most meaningful contributions. So, you know, just early on being a product of public school in Brooklyn, New York at a time where New York was in tremendous turmoil, I think there were obstacles, you know, to transitioning to an elite college like Harvard. But I think understanding and learning how to navigate and really getting the kind of mentorship and not only the mentorship from, as I just mentioned, Ruth, but also from peers, uh, I think was a tremendous life lesson. You know, I served as the first African-American uh, chief resident at the Brigham and Women's, which is one of the premier teaching hospitals at Harvard. And it was a great honor, but you know, that was a tremendous weight at the time. And I think you feel not only a sense of responsibility for those that you're working with and, and the patients, but you have the weight of being the model, the example that you have to set for those who come behind you. Now, hopefully those experiences in the future will not be as many as we populate and get more diversity in different fields. But I think that has been kind of an ongoing test in my own life and one that I've kind of dedicated myself to, again, ending. So as we think about diversifying fields. And I think as I, as I look back, you know, a theme has really been making sure that you get the support that you need and figure out ways to find it and that it's not a weakness to need support. And I think that for sure, for those of us who may confront stereotypes or assumptions about our talents or education or skills, it again is so important. So, you know, as I talk to young people, I always share not only the joys, but I also share the struggles because it makes it real and it makes it clear that their own experiences are not unique, but they are ones that, that they too will learn from and can move forward with. Your comments really resonate with me because to me, every leader needs a strong team around them. And the key is to have the right people in the right places and that are going to complement your leadership. Yeah. Now, what motivated you, though, to make the transition into management and leadership? You know, you talked about the position, but it's very interesting to find someone who's a doctor that then wants to be a leader and a manager. Yeah. Well, you know, it's interesting, Hank, because as an academic physician, as an investigator, a researcher, I really tested management and leadership roles relatively early on in my academic career. So in fact, it was really in the 19, mid-1990s, while continuing my research, 
One thing I realized was that I enjoyed learning about how complex systems and organizations worked and how we could use the best evidence to improve operations and the care of patients. And, and that means all patients, which really dovetailed with my research, which focused on really understanding how to decrease disparities in the delivery of healthcare. So I ended up actually rising to lead a department that was responsible for driving quality of care in the early days of, of that movement. Um, and it was a, a relatively new idea that was coming of age. And what we did very differently, and again, it takes leadership from the top. So the CEO believed in this vision that driving quality of care had to include equity and in decreasing these disparities. So, you know, that was almost 25 years ago, and it was somewhat unusual at the time. And, you know, as I said, I continued my research, and the ideas that came out of that were really this focus on the idea that women's health, that women's bodies, their biology really is different. That we, because of the way science was being done, hearkening back to Ruth Hubbard, was really very much male focused, that we were missing a lot of what needed to be learned about women's biology and therefore the health and well being of women. And we had begun to get a little hint of this in what we call observational studies. So that's where you don't do an intervention. But back then, most trials didn't include women. So it was really in 2000, after Bill Clinton had signed into law the 1993 NIH Revitalization Act that uh, mandated the inclusion of women, women and minorities in phase three clinical trials, that the data began to emerge and it was being in the right place with those ideas, that research focus that allowed me then to found the Connor Center for Women's Health and Gender Biology and the division, an academic division at Brigham and Women's Hospital and Harvard Medical School. So it was exciting and um, it was quite innovative at the time because we weren't building a division that was, um, was dependent on recruiting all of our own faculty but by having a core faculty and growing through joint appointments and through that structure, we were really able to drive the science and innovation and clinical care in ways that would have been impossible had we been in a silo. You know, and then obviously that brought me then to Wellesley College. And there's been a through line there, obviously, in terms of thinking about the health and well-being and the advancement of women. There sure is. And one of the major reasons I wanted to do this podcast is I've watched your management style and I've been really impressed with that. And I'm going to want to get to that in a minute. But first, I want to go to, you know, the, the benefit of a women's college. And so you lead Wellesley, which, as we've said, is the premier women's college. Wellesley women have a leadership tradition with Hillary Clinton and Madeleine Albright being two of the most well-known graduates, but there are many other Wellesley graduates in leadership roles throughout America and the world. As a matter of fact, during the very consequential presidential election we recently completed, some Wellesley leaders in state and local governments have made the college proud. Talk a bit about this and how you view the distinctive role and benefit of an all women's college. Now, I've seen this on a firsthand basis throughout my career when I've encountered Wellesley women in business and in government and not for profits. They've so often been very impressive leaders. Well, you know, thank you, Hank. And you're so right. And, you know, let's just start with the women playing roles center stage right now and getting women without a doubt into elected office and in other public leadership positions is something that is increasingly central to our mission as we think about what in Wellesley education means. And we know that getting more women into these critical positions is good for the country and we know it's good for the world and data show that. And we are so fortunate that so many of these inspiring and I call them inspiring beacons so Jocelyn Benson right now is Michigan's really courageous Secretary of State. 
she's class of 99 and you know she's been out in front with the governor and the attorney general both women to ensure that Michigan's election results really reflected the will of the people and she's done so as has the governor and the attorney general at great personal risk and then there are others Michelle Au just elected to Georgia's state senate she'll be the first asian american in this role and by the way she's also class of 1999 and she's a physician an anesthesiologist who also holds a degree in public health. So you see, we're all over the place as doctors. And, you know, I do think that I could go on. We've got seven state representatives in the Massachusetts state legislature who are Wellesley graduates, one of whom is Liz Miranda, who is just phenomenal class of 2002. Liz was born to an immigrant mother who was in high school at the time. And grew up in an under-resourced Boston community. And, you know, she recalled later that she remembers banners that hung from the lamppost reading, women who will make a difference in the world as our mission. And she really embodies that mission. So, you know, what is special? And I think that, you know, Wellesley is a place that is tremendously empowering to women. It's the way it was founded. It was not founded as a finishing school. It was founded as a powerful school that was felt to be essential for the continuation of democracy. And its founders, Pauline and Henry Durant, you know, really assembled a phenomenal faculty who did things like sent their science faculty to Germany to provide this outstanding education. And if you fast forward to today, You know, this is an environment in which women see themselves, young women see themselves all around, all around themselves. I mean, they they see 52% faculty of uh, women faculty. They see them in the fields that are really predominantly male, like economics. Economics is our number one, is our most popular major. Computer science, philosophy. These are areas that are very male dominated, but we have phenomenal faculty, a lot of women, you know, they go to school in a place where all the buildings are named after women. The portraits are women. So I think they don't necessarily come to Wellesley at this point because it's a women's college, but what they do, they come here because they know we are a leading top liberal arts college. But by the time they graduate, they are convinced that the education they received at a women's college has been transformative. Yep. You know, I, I remember being at one of the reunions with my 90 year old mother and when Madeleine Albright was speaking and she, she threw out that line, which she, she uses often that there's a special place in hell for, yes. women who, for a woman who get ahead and don't help other women. Yes. My mother yes. jumped up and said, go girl. Yeah. <laughs> and you know, you know, secretary Albright has gotten in trouble for that, but I could not agree with her more. And that's the ethic, that's the belief system here. And I truly believe, and I don't believe, I know for a fact that that is the ethic that our students leave with. And not only for their fellow alumni, but for other women in the world and having that sense of responsibility to bring others along. Right, well, now, Paula, I want to get to the Paula Johnson management principles. Because <laughs> you have what I call in all of the college full court press approach to leadership, active engagement with students, faculty, alumni, dormitory life, the broader college community. So tell us about your leadership principles. Well, you know, I, I would say that, first of all, you've got to really like what you do. And, you know, I think that that is first and foremost, because if you're going to be all in, you can't fool people. You know, I think that you have got to have a sense of excitement, enjoyment, and meeting the challenges with real purpose and focus. And and I think for me, that's been true in everything that I've done. And that's been core for me. You know, when I think about and of how I consider leadership, there's a, a definition that I tend to use from the Harvard Business Review, and that is that leadership 
is about making others better as a result of your presence and making sure that impact lasts in your absence. And I think it's really kind of a statement that I live by. And, you know, it begins by getting very clear on your core values and commitments, making them clear to your team and to, and to those around you and being really open and flexible about everything else. And we have to really always question leadership and service to what? And that's the question out of which, in my mind, everything else flows. And, you know, for me, that core commitment over my life has been improving women's health and well being and advancing the status of women. And I think that that's a through line throughout my career that excites me, that continues to get me up every day asking new and different questions and facing the challenges that today's world presents. So, you know, I, I think that it's a, a tough time right now. It's a time of polarization. But I think that, again, another ethic is the practice of empathy and really trying to always step into someone else's shoes before coming to decisions or passing judgment. And with empathy, it really takes a commitment to active listening. So I'd say those are some of the things that have really driven me across my career. But what struck me, Paula, is it's one thing to say those things. It's another thing to live them. And, you know, I, I look at accountability in people who run to problems rather than run away from them. Yeah. And so you're so actively engaged. Now, maybe, you know, Wellesley, it's maybe in some ways it's harder, in some ways it's easier with Wellesley, right? Because when you've got a great institution, it's harder to make changes. But it's also not a huge one. So you've got, you know, how many students at Wellesley, how many faculty, what's the size of the broader community? Yeah, so we've got 2,400 students, about 350 faculty, and, you know, maybe, I don't know, 1,000 staff. See, what hits me is that you're leading from the front. You know, if there's an issue, you're talking with the alumni about it, you're dealing with the students, you're looking at the dormitories and, and so on. And I guess to do that, you've got to really plan your time very carefully, but it's been really interesting for me to see that. Yeah. Now, there's a much greater emphasis on diversity within liberal arts institutions. And you have a unique approach when it comes to diversity. It's one that you call inclusive excellence. Explain what that phrase means to you and how does it apply to the environment you are trying to create at Wellesley? What are you instilling in the culture there? Right, so, you know, what we call inclusive excellence, you know, I think today in today's words might be the whole movement for diversity, equity, and inclusion. But the reason why I like inclusive excellence better is because it speaks to the fact that without diversity, you cannot be excellent. And taking it a step farther is that you can't truly achieve the highest level of excellence until you have embraced that diversity as an institution. Now, what does that mean? It means that it's one thing to go by the numbers uh, and count you know, whatever the metrics you're using, whether it be race and ethnicity, socioeconomic status, I'm talking now as a college president, region, national, you know, international. It's another thing to say that at your institution, whether it be a college, university, or business, that your institution has really thought deeply about how all of those groups have a sense of belonging and are able to flourish within your institution. And that's the work that is really hard. That's the work that requires institutional change. It's not just an onboarding of people. And so that is the journey we have been on at Wellesley. It is driven by all corners of the college led in terms of the academic program by the faculty, but student life and, and staff. And we have metrics. And I think the most important piece is that this is the work for the long haul. This is not 
something that you achieve in a year or two. It is something that given the history of our country is going to take a long time, but we just have to hold ourselves accountable to where we're starting and what the vision is for where we end up. And I'm very proud of the work that we are doing at Wellesley, the journey we're on, the embracing of the institutional change down to the individual level of individual responsibility that we're really seeing. But I do think equating this work with excellence is absolutely critical. Yeah, I think that's the key thing that uh, really spoke to me. You're running an institution that's always emphasized excellence and you're transforming it in a way you're gonna continue to emphasize excellence, but it's gonna be a more inclusive excellence. Now, I wanna talk a little bit about the national conversation. So you've talked a bit about some of the experiences throughout your career and how they've you know, shaped your views around race and culture. And our country is grappling with this now. So talk a bit about this and what's missing from the national conversation. So, you know, what I, what I would say initially is that the national conversation seems to be shifting, which is really terrific because it's the first time really since the civil rights movement. And, you know, I was a child at the time, but it's the first time where we seem to be mobilized and engaged across the country in these conversations in looking for how we make change, whether it be in the government, whether it be in business, whether it be in higher ed. And so I, I think we may, you know, that the question is, how do we keep that momentum going? You know, what I would say is, as we think about lived experiences, I don't know if we've really had as much of an understanding and respect for what diversity really brings to the table and what some of the fundamental issues are that we have to address. So, you know, I'll just share my own experience, you know, whether it was the fact that as a child, we moved into a red line neighborhood and having what my family thought was going to be an excellent school change into one that required us to move for a decent education segregation within schools. Now, this is in Brooklyn, New York, and having to advocate for resources and excellence due to low expectations. So, you know, I understood from a very young age what implicit bias was, even if the term hadn't been invented. And I had a deep understanding that for my family, for my sister and I to flourish, we needed to not only work twice as hard, but we needed to do the work that it would take to ensure that we would have the resources that we should rightfully have, for example, in a public system. So if you think about that, that is a foundational inequity. And we were very fortunate, but I think it's now finally the country is waking up to some of those fundamental inequities, what we're now calling structural racism. And I think that, you know, if you read Isabel Wilkerson's brilliant new book, Cast, you know, it tells this story powerfully and really beautifully. So I do think that what's been missing is a real reckoning with our past. And I think, as I said earlier, this may be a moment in which all of government business, higher ed at the highest levels are really thinking about how they grapple with those deep rooted issues. It's not just about diversifying leadership and rank and file but it's really about that fundamental change that needs to happen. And I think that the pandemic has clearly only brought these issues to the fore even more. You know, I call it the triple pandemic. We've got COVID-19, structural racism, and growing economic inequality. And I think, you know, with so much loss of life and so much pain, I think it might be the moment for us to come to deal with this. Yep, you know, and it's not, it's reckoning with the past, but as you say, it's dealing with the structural problems going forward. And you talked about the foundational inequity around education. I've looked at it, you know, education as being a basic civil right. That's right. And, and I remember very early in my career when I was working in the White House and looking at education, just being struck by how broken the system was 
because we had public schools largely funded by property taxes. Right. And when you look at these neighborhoods and these often blighted neighborhoods, you know, that's a double whammy. You don't have the revenues you need. And then the property taxes are a heavy weight on any kind of development in the neighborhoods. And so how you deal with that, you know, and I, I don't think until we fix that, I don't know how we begin to deal with so many of the other problems. As you say, it's just not a matter of appointing diverse candidates in key leadership roles. It's dealing with these structural problems. Now, you mentioned the pandemic, and I, I, I wanted to talk about that because you are a renowned doctor and previously served as a professor of epidemiology at Harvard. That sure sounds like a perfect resume for any leader during a global pandemic. Talk about your approach to managing your institution during COVID-19. What are the biggest challenges and how are you dealing with them? Yeah, well, you know, Hank, it's, it's well, first of all, who would have thought that four years into my tenure at Wellesley, that my background in medicine and public health would come to the fore in this way. It's been quite a journey. And, you know, I would say that I've really felt so fortunate to be able to really put my background to work. So, you know, the, the first thing I'm gonna say is that, you know, I'm very fortunate. We live in a state, and I think it's important to recognize the importance of state governments. We live in a state of Massachusetts and Charlie Baker has really been outstanding. You know, we actually had a governor's uh, higher education working group and I led the effort to develop our testing protocols for higher ed in Massachusetts. We were fortunate to not only have the scientists, actually one of the scientists who met with us weekly and helped us formulate our plans was Dr. Rochelle Walensky who has been named to head the CDC. So we were fortunate to have outstanding science. And then we were really very fortunate to work with, for example, the Broad Institute, one of the world's leading genomic institutes led by Eric Lander that stepped up to really ramp up COVID testing for higher ed, but for so much more in our state. So I would say the first thing that we've done, and this is what I've learned from both medicine, but particularly public health, is that it takes a team and we assembled an outstanding team and we worked to develop the evidence-based strategies that would work not only for the most well-endowed institutions, but we did this across the state for those who had large endowments, those who didn't have any community colleges and state institutions as well. So I think I'm very proud of the work that's been done here. And then at Wellesley very specifically, you know, we've created the operations and really it's taken again. It is that ability to have an outstanding team who's gonna flex in new and different ways to get the job done and get the job done based on the best evidence. And I would say we've had that. And so the good news is that, you know, we were able to bring back half of our students in the fall. Uh, we had very, very few COVID cases. We had a lot of asymptomatic testing, but a lot of protocols and I won't go into all the details, but you know, everything from mapping classrooms to new protocols in dining halls and cleaning protocols. And just, it, it took everyone, it took the faculty redesigning their curricula. And again, this was really dedication to the mission of the college. So it's one thing to kind of come from on high and, and kind of have a, a very good understanding of of the protocols and what needs to be done. It's another thing to get that implemented across the institution with an all-in mentality. And I think that's been truly, you know, charting uncharted territory, but bringing a lot of joy in this period of great difficulty and pain. Yep. And I assume you've had, you know, some cl classes where the students are right there in the classroom and others where they're remote, right? Yeah, in the fall semester, we had about a third of our faculty teaching in person and everyone that was done extremely safely. Both the faculty and the students, I think were so grateful for the experience, for the human connection, 
the thriving, the desire to be together and discuss. They were two and a half hour seminars that would last for longer because I think not only the thirst for that in-person knowledge and, and learning, but also for the connection. And so both the faculty and the students had really quite phenomenal experiences. And I would say also through Zoom, there's also been tremendous pedagogical innovation that has happened. We've had classes from early in the morning till late in the evening. We did that initially because we have students in China and India who couldn't make it back. But it turned out that having that flexibility, given what our workforce, given what our professors are dealing with, lack of childcare, that it worked for many of our younger women, for example, to teach a 7.30 class, 7.30 PM class, than to teach during the day when maybe a partner was home. So, you know, it's something where we, we have a, a focus on the educational mission, obviously, but we have to take care of people in their lives and have to consider what this pandemic is doing in terms of that disruption and figuring out ways that we can flex and flex in ways we never thought we would to make the entire ecosystem work. So Paula, now what, what advice do you give to young women who are navigating their careers in the midst of this crisis? You know, I would just say that what I'm really trying to do here for our young women is to lead by example. And, you know, I think to be value driven, to live a life of service, as I said, leading with empathy, finding common ground. Um, I think these are all critical, particularly in this period of time. You know, there are always ways to connect and to obtain experience and to participate in this moment. Many of our students are engaging on the ground in civic engagement and service. Many are engaging in remote internship experiences and others are just working and helping family members. I think that all of these experiences are gonna roll into experiences that they can take forward. And so I really see this as a time of cultivating resourcefulness and resilience. And, you know, I think that if this past year has shown us anything, it's that our lives are filled with challenges and unknowns, and that the only constant is really change, as they like to say. And to say, you know, as we think about a crisis, that there are opportunities in that. You may not realize them now, but just take it a step at a time. And then, you know, you'll have that time to reflect and you'll understand the learnings that you obtained during this period. So Paula, thank you. This has been terrific. The world needs more women in important leadership positions. And that's your mission, you know, turning them out of Wellesley College and then having Wellesley College serve as a model for what other universities can do in the United States and around the world. So keep up the good work and thank you. Thank you, Hank. Thanks. It was a pleasure to be with you. You have listened to Straight Talk with Hank Paulson, a podcast of the Paulson Institute. To find more episodes from leading thinkers and doers, please visit paulsoninstitute.org backslash straight talk or download on Apple, Google Play, Spotify, and Stitcher. And don't forget to rate and subscribe. Thank you for listening and see you next time.